So the two disciplines that I'm going to talk about today, uh, philosophy is in philosophy of action and decision theory as used by economists. So in decision theory, in the standard model of decision making by self over time, there's no place for intentions. So there's a notion of plan, but a plan has to be something that you're certain you're going to carry out given the situation you know you're going to find yourself in later on. So this, they call this incentive compatible. Um, so you, it must be in your best interest to follow it, you're, you're, and, you, and you predict you'll follow it. In fact, in effect, they reduce planning to prediction. But in contrast, in philosophy, there's, an there's a notion of intentions and willpower, um, and intentions are supposed to have some sort of causal power in helping somebody to achieve self-control. So what I want to do in this talk is show how filling that lacuna in decision theory and adding in the notion of a causal plan can be done. Um, and what I'm going to do is apply something called the theory of team reasoning, which was developed for the interpersonal case. I'm going to apply it to the self over time. And then I'm going to suggest that this provides a new perspective on some philosophical puzzles around the rationality of intentions. So I'm going to start off with the philosophical puzzles. And in fact, in particular, I'm going to consider a puzzle set by Michael Bratman. And I should say, if I know I'm, I'm a native speaker, and most of you aren't, and I talk quite fast. Um, and a lot of this material might be new for people. So feel free at any point to put your hand up and ask if something's not clear. But maybe we'll save substantive questions to the end. But if you need any clarification, then just stop me. So I'm going to talk about, present a puzzle that comes from the work of Michael Bratman. So Michael Bratman decides it would be best to have a general policy of only having one glass of wine at dinner because he wants to be able to work after dinner. But when he makes that policy, he knows that at dinner time, he'll always be tempted to have a second glass. So whatever he might have thought before dinner, at dinner time, it says, in the light of considerations that now matter to me, it will seem better to have a second glass of wine. So this is what Richard Holton might call a judgment shift. So his judgment before dinner is, one glass of wine. His judgment during dinner is going to be two glasses of wine, and he knows that in advance. And so then the question is, well, now he thinks, well, what happens then at dinner time? Well, you might think there's two ways of dealing with temptation. Um, one, which you might associate with the work of Richard Holton, is the idea of what I've called rational non-consideration. So the idea that it is rational not to reconsider that intention. However, Bratman, following from something Sarah Paul says, thinks, well, whatever the rationality of reconsidering, psychologically, it may be very hard not to reconsider. So what happens once I open the question again? And in fact, um, lots of people think that once you open the question, then it is all up for reconsideration. So for instance, John Broome thinks that one of the roles of an intention is really sort of to carry you through to action, and an intention should carry you through up until, uh, to action unless, until or unless there's a cancelling event. And reopening the question is a cancelling event. So the, once you reopen it, the intention seems to not have much standing. Um, so what should one do? And so depending on whether we're thinking about rational non-consideration or reconsideration, we come up with sort of different sets of questions. So for Richard Holton, we have this question of why is it rational not to reconsider? And hopefully, well, my plan is to come, depending how time goes, um, to come back to that at the end of the talk. Uh, I don't know how time's going. Right. Um, but Bratman takes it in a slightly different direction because he's saying, well, what happens if I reconsider? And Bratman thinks that there's something that he calls rational priority of present valuation. 
So whatever I think now, whatever my rational judgment is now, that takes priority over past and previous judgments. And actually the way he puts it, it's quite wordy, so I've got this up here. Um, he says, if the agent has a relevant judgment at T2, so at the later time, concerning which alternative would be strictly best at that time too, then if the agent is functioning rationally, she'll opt for that alternative. But then he thinks, well, before dinner, when you come to make this plan not to have two glasses of wine, knowing that at dinner, you'll change your best judgment, your, your judgment, and knowing that we think that there's a um, rational priority of present evaluation, so come dinner, it will be rational to then have two glasses of wine. What can we say about the rationality of forming the prior intention before dinner, his general policy to only have one glass of wine. Given his other commitments, that looks problematic for him. And so really those are the sort of puzzles that I want to come back to. I know we're going to talk a lot about decision theory, but then at the end, I'm going to come back to these, um, these two puzzles of why it's rational not to reconsider and um, what is the st rationality status of the prior intention? How can you rationally form it? Okay. So in decision theory, as practiced by economists, um, when you model a self over time, it's sometimes called the theory of dynamic choice. And in the theory of dynamic choice, effectively, you model the individual as a series of what we could call time slices. So Strotz, who is a pioneer in the field, said that individual over time is an infinity of individuals. So then he was interested in the possibility there could be, for instance, bargaining within the self. Now, the reasoning that these time slices do is by backwards induction, which is, might be familiar to philosophers in the room from the work of David Hume. But I'll just introduce it with a, with a very simple example, um, partly in case people aren't familiar with it, and partly because I think this example shows how strange it is to think of a person in this way. So in my little simple example, imagine an agent that has to cross a two-lane street. Um, so, um, so the, and there's two lanes, so let's have split it into two parts and say and have two agents and let's call them P1 and P2 um, and say that the agent wants to cross from west to east. So how is this supposed to work? Well P1, the first agent, has to think, ask himself, to the reason backwards from the end. So they have to say what will the second player do if I go to the middle and think, oh yes, well, she'll also want to cross to the east side of the street, so she'll carry on the action. So she'll cross the street. Given that I, then, given that I want to get to the other side of the street, and I know that the second part of me will carry on doing that, then she can conclude I should go to the middle of the street. So already that seems kind of weird because the first time slice, as I'll call it, has to think about I mean, it's clear that there's a, there's a common purpose there. They're both going to do the same thing. And she'd be, she's supposed to work out whether her future self is going to have the incentive to carry on with the action. And also, there's no room in this way of thinking about the self for a plan or just to say, I'm going to cross the street, I'm going to attend to cross the street, and then that's going to give my future self a reason to continue across the street. So it looks kind of odd. But, however, it does provide a very neat model of failures of self-control. So this is a famous example by um, two economists, O'Donoghue and Rubin. Um, and I'm just going to give you the outline of their model. So the story is that it's called a Saturday night at the movies because you're a regular cinema goer or movie goer in the States and you have a pre-purchased ticket for the next month that gets you into all four movies on every Saturday night. 
However, you also have a report to write for work that has to be done by the end of the month and you've got no other time to do it, so you're going to have to miss one of the movies. And you have to work out which night you're going to stay at home and write the report. And the schedule for the movies has already been released. So you already know that in week one, there's going to be a mediocre movie. In week two, there'll be a good movie. In week three, they're showing a great movie. And in week four, they're showing a Johnny Depp movie. And Johnny Depp movie is supposed to be a good movie. Um, and this was, to be fair, I guess this was written about 20 years ago when he was still making good films and hadn't completely embarrassed himself um, in front of the press. Um, so Edward Scissorhands, good film. So, and you have to decide which, when you're going to write the report. Now, it seems obvious really, given that you know the programme, that you should write the report in week one. Um, and that's what a self operating at, call it T naught, before the month starts, um, would do. But it turns out that all you need is a little bit of present bias of favouring the current self, and somebody who makes that plan ends up missing the Johnny Depp movie. So in order to see why, put a few very simple numbers in and then assume that um, and this is how good we think each movie is kind of objectively um, and so the cost for a self of writing the report would we'll think is the report well, has to be written at some point anyway but the, the, the real cost is missing the movie so that's just missing that movie is also the cost and now Imagine that a self just puts a double weight on itself. So you can imagine in, t in terms of Bratman, sort of who says, you know, I might change to my mind in the light of considerations that now matter to me. Um, so week one, so in T0, you would say, well, clearly, let's miss week one. It's the least good movie. But then at T1, imagine you had a very difficult week, um, you're quite tired, and you just think, well, although the movie's objectively not the best movie, it really means a lot to me this week to have a night out and to relax. So imagine we sort of double weight um, the current time slices, the utility, it's an eco economic model, so utility in its standard empty and meaningless terms. Double weight that utility, but then two times three is six. So now it's like, should I do the, do the report or should I leave it till next week? Well, actually, this movie is currently looking to me like it's worth six. I'm going to forego six if I write the report. And the, OK, next week's movie is better, but objectively, it's still only a five. So I'll put the report off till next week. But then imagine the second Saturday of the month and you've had a difficult week and you're like, objectively, it's only a good movie, but it would mean so much for me to go that, you know, my judgment, my considered judgment is changed and actually um, I'm double weighting it and it really would mean 10 to me tonight. But now, should I do it tonight or should I wait and do it next week? But now 10 is greater than 8, the great movie that's, that's valued at 8. So actually, I should kick the can down the road again. And the same thing happens in week three. If you double weight eight, it's 16, which is greater than 13. So, and the, come the fourth night, the, well, the report has to be written, so the self ends up missing the Johnny Depp movie. Um, and, and it should be said, so I've done, that's the totally, as the economists call it, the naive self who thinks that they can make a plan and keep to the plan and end up missing the best movie. But in fact, in this model, even the self who's got a bit more self-knowledge and knows that they're going to do this every week and does backwards induction, which again, very naive self didn't do, ends up missing the good movie in week two. They still procrastinate. So um, a bit of present bias can give you effectively a problem of self-control. It's a bit of temptation all week. And, the, and you missed the best movie. And the thing about this example is that missing the week four movie is by no means 
something that the individual time slices are very happy with. I mean, it's the worst alternative for all of the first three selves, and it's not. And for week and and for week four self, um, actually, it's also the worst. It's sorry, it's not the worst alternative for all of them, but it's none of their best alternatives. And for all of the last three selves, it is their best alternative if it gets done in week one. And although it's not week one's favourite alternative, it is their second best alternative. Um, so in fact, what's sort of happened is that every individual time slice in there seems to have made themselves worse off. Um, and there's an option that looks obvious to all of us from some perspective, and that most of them could agree would be better, namely to do the report in week one. Um, the other thing that, where you might see this as well is that there's a sense in which there's what economists would call, quote, an externality going on. So what's that? Well, in economic terms, an externality is when an agent does an activity, but they don't get all of either the costs or the benefits. So some third party has to bear either a cost or a benefit. And in this case, um, there's a sense in which there's an externality. The self that stays home to write the report is also allow allows the other self to go to the movie. So they're getting a benefit. They're, they're, the self who does the movie takes the cost for which benefits are distributed amongst some of the other time slices. Now, the reason for pulling out the stuff, externalities are usually thought of in an interpersonal case. So there's a sense in which this is an intrapersonal <coughs> externality. But one reason for bringing out the idea of an externality is that, again, there's nice parallels to individual behavior in groups. OK, so what I want to suggest is that, um, oh, and one more thing before I go on to that is um, you might think about so what it, so that's a nice, very nice sort of economic model of a problem of self control. What help can economics give the four selves, the four time slices who are facing this problem? Well, the answer is they have to, I, they have to change the incentives or change the options. So, for instance, um, in T naught, if we allow a planning self who occurs first, maybe they could that person could make a side bet with a friend um, so that they have to pay the friend or some charity they really hate uh, an amount of money if they go to the week one movie. So that it changes the incentives for the week one self and makes them stay home to write the report. Or they could change the options by ripping up the week one cinema ticket. Imagine the movie theater is sold out. Um, so those are sort of what economics can say. What the self can't do is form an intention and expect that to have any power. The self that formed an intention in week naught was naive and ended up putting off the movie, putting off the report until week four and missing the Johnny Depp movie. So, what I want to suggest is that we can apply something called team reasoning that was developed to explain problems of coordination and cooperation between people, and that we can use that to help with this um, problem across time. So, team reasoning was introduced because partly to add in levels of agency into economics and decision theory. So, in economics, when thinking about cooperation, it's standard to think that all agents are individuals. They can care about other people and incorporate others' outcomes into their preferences. Nevertheless, individuals pursue individual goals and use individual strategic reasoning. And so the idea of team reasoning was to allow that a group could be an agent. So you can see I'm then going to suggest there's a parallel where 
the intrapersonal case so is modeling each individual time slice as an agent and it needs again an overarching level of agency so we could apply this levels of agency approach but i'll explain it within the interpersonal problem um, so the, and the idea of team reasoning is really for group members to be able to say well we think we the group are an agent um, what combination of actions best achieves the group objectives and then they can do their part in it. And the theory of team reasoning was inspired by a couple of different um, games that have been seen as puzzles for economists. And, and hopefully again, these also sort of tweak the intuition that if somebody's allowed to ask, what can we do, then th that solves the puzzle. So the first game is this game called High Low. Now, it's coordination. This is a payoff matrix for a game. So there's two players. Player one's payoffs are always the first one in the pair. And player two payoffs are the second one. These are the two actions they can take. They can each take high or low and get these payoffs. And in game theory, people look for what's called a Nash equilibrium, which is where each player is doing as well as they can, given what the other player has done. So in this game, high low, there are two equilibria, high high, because if player one has played high, then so should player two, and low low. If player one goes low, then player two also needs to go low, because otherwise they both get zero. So there are two Nash equilibrium. But then when you look at it and think, well, what's the right way to play the game? It seems obvious they should both play high, because they're both individually better off if they play high. But the thing about standard game theory, standard economics, is it can't deconditionalize the strategies. Each player does the best they can, given what the other person does. So there are two equilibria. When, and when people, in fact, and the only, so it seems so obvious that um, no one really tests what people do in this game, but in the one test I've seen of it, everybody except for one of the subjects played high. So it just seems so obvious. And yet, as a game theorist, if you want to say that high high is the only equilibrium, you have to start, you have to add in some extra assumptions. Like you have to start to say, well, if there are two equilibria, then we go for the what's called the payoff dominant one, because everybody does better there. But you can't just derive it from classical canons. Um, and the second puzzling game for people is the prisoner's dilemma. So Defect is what's, is what's called a dominant strategy, because whatever the other player does, um, a player is better off defecting. So player one, if, um, if player two cooperates, then player one is better off defecting, because five's better than four. And if player two defects, then three is better than zero, so they should defect. However, if both players defect, we end up down here, they both get three, whereas they would each have been individually better off if they'd cooperati cooperated. Um, and to some people, at least, it seems kind of strange that rationality says to do. And he, here it's an unconditional, it's not even conditional, because this is not an equi equilibrium. There's one equilibrium in this game, and it's both defect. And people think it's kind of strange that rationality would lead both players to make themselves worse off. Whereas if you, they ask themselves the question, what should we do? You might be open which, or which outcome of these three they prefer, but it's clear that they shouldn't choose that one because it's dominated by a different outcome where they'd both be better off. So, and at least some people have the intuition that it would be rational to both cooperate. And prison's dilemma is also interesting um, comparison to the O'Donoghue and Rubin sort of set up. As I said, there was an, an externality in O'Donoghue and Rubin. Well, Prison's Dilemma is a classic model of externality. So, for instance, pollution is a Prison's Dilemma because, you know, there's a, a factory pollute, a company pollutes because there's some benefit. Obviously, there's a cost to, like, dirty air, but that's spread out amongst everyone because you don't own the air. Um, but then if every factory pollutes, the air could be very dirty and they might actually each individually wish that nobody was polluting. And you can even see the setup in this, in this matrix um, 
I've put in numbers that make the externality fairly obvious, because you might think, well, if they both cooperated, they both get 12, but a player who defects is, is in effect grabbing six for themselves and taking 12 away for the other. But if they both grab six for themselves and take 12 away from the other, then they, add, then they end up down there. Um, so it's almost like saying there's a benefit of grabbing six with an externality of 12 for the other. And if they don't take into account the externality, then they both end up worse off. So a little bit like the externality and the self over time. Um, and I certainly wouldn't claim, so it's slightly, comp selves over time are complicated and there are obviously differences. Most importantly, that players in a group, in a standard prisons dilemma, all exist at the same time. Whereas play in a self over time, the time slices go in sequence. But certainly, I, there are ways in which that sort of problem of self-control can turn to prisoner's dilemma. But you don't have to buy into all that. You can think that there's an externality, and there's quite a lot of ways that that can fall out in terms of complicated games. Um, and then you've already got a nice parallel. So the idea in team reasoning is that the individuals in the team perform their part of the best team plan. So what they do, um, as when, they're, when, they're, when an individual identifies with reasons as a member of a team, she considers which combination of actions by members of the team would best promote the team's objectives and then performs her part of that combination. So she's really thinking, what do we want to achieve and how can I play my part? And this, by the way, is the British women's football team. So people often use football as an example. So in the sort of most simple case, and you can see there's quite a lot of common knowledge criteria in here, um, if it's common knowledge that everyone in the group, group, so what we think is that if someone group identifies, then they can team reason and think about what should we achieve and what do I do to play my part. But then you have to group identify to do that. Um, and you might think in the most simple case, when would someone do that? Well, if there's common knowledge that all the group members, group identifies, and if there's common knowledge that they each try to, we can put it in economics terms, maximize the team payoff function, but basically they're all aiming at the same thing that they think they ought to achieve. Um, and if there's a unique, what we call a profile of action, so um, there's one action that you can give to every member that will achieve that outcome, then they can reason they should choose that part of the profile. So there's quite a lot of, um, you might say fairly strong assumptions here, but they can all be weakened. The point is to make it a nice, simple case. Um, and then it seems to solve the, the problem games, because if there's two players playing high-low and they think of themselves as a group with um, who's trying to achieve something, well, what would they try to achieve? Well, it seems pretty obvious that the preferred outcome would be high-high because it makes all the individuals better off. Um, so they can each reason that they should choose high in order to achieve the outcome high-high. Prison's dilemma is a bit more tricky because some of it will depend on how you rank these off-diagonal payoffs. But in this example, given what I've written for the payoffs, it's at least plausible that the cooperative outcome would be ranked higher. And in that case, if you think that both cooperate is the unique team optimal outcome, and both players, they each group identify and they each know the other one group identifies, then they can also each reason that they should choose cooperate as part of achieving the cooperative outcome. Um, and then I'm going to skip if people may have questions about um, other ways that people model cooperation dilemmas, about whether you can do it by transforming the payoffs. But I think I'll skip that, and people can ask me about that if they want to know. Um, and I'm also not going to talk about that. But as I said, it is possible to turn um, the intrapersonal problem into a prisoner's dilemma sort of matrix if you really wanted to do the maths of team reasoning. 
but I would rather use the time, I think, to come back to the philosophical puzzles and you can pull me back to those things if you want to hear about them. So here's one difference that seems very salient between um, the person over time and the people in the group. And that's that what I mentioned before, that person over time, the team members occur in sequence. Um, oh, maybe, um, where it, and in a group, they are all there at the same time. But it's also true that in some teams, not every individual does actually work out what they ought to do. Sometimes they have um, what Michael Buckrack has called a director, when in this case, well, they've got a coach, who's this lady, Hope Powell, who's the, we'll call her the director. But what I mean by that is that there's one person who works out what the team ought to do and tells the individual members what they should do. And okay, um, in a very abstract way, because this wouldn't quite what happened with the football team, but it helps, would help to understand the point. You could imagine a coach that had devised a play, but instead of telling everybody all together in the locker room, she tells each individual team member their part of the play, um, so they only know their part. So, but then if they see the team as an agent, so they may not do any kind of individual reasoning about what they ought to do, or they may not actually work out all the complicated steps of the plan, but if, so long as they know that there was a director who had a plan and told them their part, then if they know that they identify as a group agent and that other people identify too, then they can just play their part. And we could call that a team mechanism. So one, so one mechanism behind team agency is that people do the entire, an entire sort of team reasoning calculation, as it were, and work out what they ought to do. Another mechanism is that a director just gives them their part in the plan. Um, and once you think of a, the interpersonal problem in this way, it gives us another handle on how we can deal with the person over time occurring in sequence. Because we could consider the T naught self, the planner, as the director. Um, and then it's not the case that every self has to perform reasoning, which is also good because in terms of our intuition of um, what people do, they don't constantly re-perform, um, remake their judgments about what they ought to do. So as long as they can rely on the director to have made a good plan, all they really need to do is commit the plan to memory and provided their team reasoners um, to play their part. So then you can see how in the O'Donoghue and Rabin model, what could happen is a T0 self could make the plan to write the report in week one and do the reasoning. And then, or well, whichever week turned out to be best if it wasn't week one. And then all that the later time slices have to do is to remember the plan and play their part. So, so long as they see themselves as part of the team agent, in this case, the team being the person over time, then they can just carry out their plan. And then of course, the problem comes when um, time slice agency rears its head because then it seems like the best thing to do is going to be to throw away the plan and do what's good for me now because for whichever agent the director decided should write the report, if they think about it as a time slice, they're going to think, well, actually, uh, I think I might change my judgment there. Um, and the other thing, of course, that we can bear in mind is um, that the problem of self-control, as I've suggested, that what's doing it in these models is some time slice centered reasoning. So if you sort of buy into this framework, what's 
going wrong is that some, some parts of the self aren't thinking of themselves as an agent over time, They're thinking, or a temporally extended agent. They're thinking of themselves as a me now. Um, so of course, the director can't just blindly assume that everyone's going to follow their plan. But again, so you can't just assume that every member will group identify, in this case, with the person over time. But that's fine. That just adds in layers of complication. I mean, there is a theory, a, a bells and whistle on the interpersonal theory of team reasoning called circumspect team reasoning, which is how you work out what you do when you think that not all of the group members will group identify. So similarly, you can think the director can do some circumspect team reasoning and work out the best plan given that the future self might not function as a team member. And that's sort of in accordance with evidence that expectations of personal efficacy are important determinants of, um, of whether or not people exhibit self-control, as in the Bandura theory. OK, so I'm going to come back and see what we can say about the philosophical problems then. I said that Richard Holton is interested in questions about why is it, can, is it rational not to reconsider your intention? And in fact, so he defines weakness of will in terms of intentions. He introduces a class of intentions that he calls resolutions which are made, these are intentions that are explicitly made in order to prevent a future change of mind. Um, and so it's to stop you doing something you know you're going to want to in the future. And he thinks that a person exhibits weakness of will when they revise their resolution in circumstances in which they should not have revised it. But he has to be slightly careful here for the following, for a reason given by the following example. So imagine someone who makes a paraglider. They make their own homemade pa paraglider and think they're going to jump off the edge of the cliff. And they make a res They know they're likely to suffer from nerves, so they make a resolution to um, to jump off the edge of the cliff. And then when they get to the edge, they think. Hang on, what am I doing? This is really stupid. Sorry, they don't think that. Actually, that would, that would be a reason. I don't, sorry. That you, we might think, this person is crazy. What are they doing? That's really stupid. They should never have made that resolution. It would be much better for them not to jump off the cliff. And it would be much better for them to revise their resolution. And then imagine they get to the edge of the cliff and they stop. But not because they've had all these thoughts about it being a bad thing to do, but because they've got nerves. So we might think there's a sense that they should have revised it because it was a bad resolution. But he wants to say um, failures of nerve is a type of weakness of will. And weakness of will is not following through on your resolution, even when your resolution wasn't the be your best judgment, as it were, so even when it gets you to a bad place. So he actually says weakness of will is different from acrasia. So he doesn't want us to be able to say that the paraglider, he doesn't want to be pushed into a corner where he has to say the paraglider who has a crazy plan but doesn't jump off the cliff because of their nerves um, hasn't exhibited weakness of will. That, that for him, that still is an instance of weakness of will. So he actually has to say um, that we're looking for reasonable tendencies of revision. So times, the, the sort of, the, the, the what would in general tend to make you revise your plan, not just was it a bad plan and therefore have you got a good reason not to do it. Um, so what would be what he calls a reasonable tendency of revision? And he doesn't have a whole theory of that, but he does have some rules of thumb. And he thinks about when it would be reasonable to reconsider intentions and when it would be reasonable not to reconsider intentions. And he says, well, it's reasonable to have a tendency to, re to revise your intentions if the circumstances change. And it's reasonable to have a tendency to revise your 
intentions if there's going to be some, un some suffering caused that was unenvisaged at the time when you made them. And he says, it's reasonable not to reconsider your intentions when the circumstances you're currently in prevent clear thought. And it's reasonable not to reconsider your intentions when the intention was made specifically in order to get over your later reluctance to act. So let's start off with the first two, the reasons, his reasons given for reconsidering. Well, what actually is going on here is it seems that there's some sort of unpredictable circumstances or new information that the agents got. So you might think in terms of the setup that I've given where you have a director who's made a team plan and we're thinking about whether later time slices should get to reopen the question, um, that it's reason that what we're looking for is when would it be reasonable to change the team plan, which we're thinking of the intention, and that's when there's some unpredictable new circumstances or information, which makes sense. Um, and then what about the reasons not to reconsider the intentions? Well, these just look like times when you think that your earlier self, my, in my language, the director, is going to have made a better decision than you're going to make now. Um, and so there's no reason to think you'll do better than the director. And this might lead us all to think, well, where does the authority of the director come from. Um, and I think there's sort of three places we could try and put this authority. Um, so his examples really, um, the, that is the two examples at the bottom there, seem always to be cases where um, the director has what we could think of as epistemic author authority. So we think they're in a position where they're going to make a better decision. Now that definitely looks right in some cases of temptation. And in fact, in the kind of psychological picture where there's kind of cold contemplative decision-making and sort of hot temptations, we might well think something like the cold considered version has some epistemic authority. The problem is we tend to get new information as time goes on. So very often your earlier self doesn't actually have an epistemic advantage. So it looks like that's a slightly tricky place to, to, to locate the authority of the earlier self. Another thought is that maybe the earlier self has what we can call coordinative authority. In order to explain what that is, I can give you an example from an interpersonal case. So imagine that we're all going to dinner after this talk and that there's two um, restaurants. There's a, um, an Italian or an Indian. Um, and you know, ideally we'd all go to the best restaurant, um, but we'd also quite like to, we would rather that we all had dinner together. Now it might be the case that Ludwig says, let's all go to the Italian and then rush off to his office and I'll meet you there or something. And we might all think, well, maybe Ludwig doesn't really know very much about the restaurants and we wouldn't really trust his judgment. So we, nevertheless, we might think we should all go to the Italian restaurant because it's more likely that everyone will go there now. So he's kind of, despite the fact that we think his judgment is fallible, there's a coordination reason for doing what he says. And so you might think that with a self over time, the earlier self has some sort of coordinative authority. So even if they don't have an epistemic advantage, um, they're setting up long-term plans. And the, once you get started in a plan, um, by dint of getting something done in your life, you want to coordinate around what your earlier self decided to do. Um, a third possibility is the idea of representative authority. And again, I think about this with analogy to the interpersonal case. So thinking about electing 
um, a representative to a parliament, and then what actually happens once they, once they get to parliament, these representatives, is they vote on your behalf. That doesn't mean, however, that they find out what every constituent wants and do it. You kind of give them authority to use your, to vote on your behalf. Or similarly, in an academic department, maybe your head of department sits on the university committee and they get authority as your representative um, to, to talk about what the department wants. Um, whether this can actually apply in the individual case, I'm, I mean, I put it there because someone suggested it's a possibility and I think it's very interesting, but then we would be in a situation where you have a representative who's representing people who come after them. So it's slightly, it feels slightly odd, but it's a possibility. Um, anyway, so I, I, I personally, I think I'm, I think sometimes there's some epistemic authority, but I think a lot of the time we're appealing to something like coordinative authority in order um, for why people should accept the, what the, the, the plan the earlier self has made. And finally, coming back to Bratman and his puzzle, so, and his idea of rational reconsideration. And how can it be rational to make the plan in the first place? Well, so I hope you can see already, sort of within the framework I've given, that it can be rational to make a plan qua team reasoner if you think there's sufficient possibility that your later self might team reason. Um, and so it's almost like there's instrumental agency going on on two different levels. There can be time slice in instrumental agency and self over time instrumental agency. And as it were, the goals are set by which level of agency you take. Um, but then to carry on with where Bratman goes next, which I think is quite interesting, is he talks, thinks about the role of regret. Um, in rational reconsideration and why regret should lead you um, maybe not to reconsider. And he distinguishes two different roles that regret can play, what he calls an epistemic role and a practical role. So one role that regret can play is epistemic. It's a sign that you're, if you anticipate you're going to regret your action in the future, that regret, anticipated regret, is a sign that you're about to make the wrong judgment. Um, and Bratman says he's not talking about the epistemic role. But he thinks regret can play what he calls a practical role. And he identifies what he calls two different standpoints. So a standpoint, the idea of a standpoint comes from Frankfurt. And it's the way that the agent's various attitudes and other relevant features of her psychology come together, or perhaps fail to come together, to constitute a coherent, rel relevant standpoint. And he said, look, you can have a standpoint as a time slice, or a standpoint, what he calls cross-temporal, which looks very much like my intrapersonal team reasoner. Um, and he thinks that a planning agent needs to take cross-temporal time point. Um, and further, the idea is that regret is supposed to tell the age, to make the agent take the cross temporal standpoint. So it's his idea, the practical role of regret is that if a time slice anticipates feeling regret, then it's a signal to her that she ought to take a cross temporal standpoint. So it's a way of, in my terminology, prompting them to become an intrapersonal team reasoner. So then, Bratman sort of set up his problem as being time slice versus intertemporal levels of agency. Um, and of course, Bratman was worried that th there's this priority of practical evaluation. So the judgment at T2 rules. Um, however, he wants to make this sort of argument that the self over time, the cross temporal standpoints, for some reason, has priority. I think the point I want to end on is that at least the way I've set it up, we have time slice means end rationality and self over time means end rationality. So you can now see why it's rational to make the, resol the resolution quay or general plan quay, time, quay self over time. 
but also why it might be rational qua time slice not to follow through. And those both seem to be means end rational given the level of agency. So means end rationality tells agents what to do given their goals. But then that means that if he wants to make the sort of argument that self over time should take priority, and I think many people, including economists who say they're you know, not making judgments, still implicitly think that um, people who don't see themselves as a self over time, or, or people who are procrastinate are somehow irrational. So really, for a lot of people, it's very intuitive that, that in, in t temporal self has priority. But I think that the argument for why they have priority is not going to come from means and instrumental rationality. Thanks.